Did you know that i to the power of i is actually a real number? In fact, it's not just a simple real number like negative one or one. It's this kind of crazy looking decimal, 0.20787958, and it goes on and on. So that seems very strange. That's very bizarre. How could that possibly be the case? Well, that's what I want to explain in this video. Now, before we begin, I should mention that this is the very first video on this YouTube channel. So the channel literally has zero subscribers, zero likes or comments. So if you enjoy the video, I'd really appreciate it if you put a like on the video or better yet, a comment uh, down in the comment section. That would really mean a lot to me. Okay, so i to the power of i is real, and I'm not just making this up. In fact, if we go in here to Desmos, and Desmos is just an online graphing calculator. You just go to desmos.com. And within Desmos, make sure that you're in complex mode. So go over here to the settings and make sure that you have the complex mode turned on so we can use complex numbers. So for example, one of the things we can do is plot complex numbers. So four plus two i, here's the number four plus two i. So this is your real axis here. Here's your imaginary axis. Now, another thing that you can do is computation. So for example, if we type i squared, notice it gives us this answer of negative one. Or if we type i to the i, we get our decimal here, 0 0.207. So what's going on here? Why is i to the i this decimal? Okay, now I'm gonna give you kind of a quick explanation and then we'll flesh out all the details in just a minute here. But the quick explanation is that we can write i to the i as e to the natural log of i to the i. And then we can take this i and bring it out front. So we can rewrite this as e to the i times natural log of i. And then the question is, what is e to the i times natural log of i? Well, at this point, if you're familiar with Euler's formula, you may think that that's what we're gonna use. Now, Euler's formula is this beautiful formula here that says e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine of theta. And this is called Euler's formula. And you may be tempted to think that this is what we're gonna use next because notice that we have something of this form e to the i theta here, where theta is natural log of i. So we could write this as e to the i times natural log of i as cosine of natural log of i plus i sine of natural log of i. But then the question is, what's cosine of natural log of i? And what's sine of natural log of i? And so we kind of get stuck there. So we're actually not going to use Euler's formula at this point. So what are we going to do? Well, what we're going to do is find out what natural log of i is directly. So it turns out that natural log of i is pi over 2 times i. Okay, now I'll explain that here in a minute. But just take my word for it right now that natural log of i is pi over 2 times i. That's actually called the principal value of natural log of i. Okay, so if that's true, then notice at this point we have an i times an i. That would be i squared, which is negative 1. We can write this as e to the negative pi over 2. And e to the negative pi over 2, if you type this into the calculator, that gives you this decimal, 0 0.207 and on and on. So i to the power of i is e to the negative pi over 2, which is this crazy decimal that we looked at. So that's kind of the short explanation. Now, e to the negative pi over 2 is what's called the principal value of i to the i. So I'll explain what I mean by that in a second. But notice here, the one big step that I kind of left out, the one thing I didn't explain was, why is natural log of i equal to pi over 2 times i? Now, one of the great things about complex analysis is that we can take many of our familiar functions. So for example, like sine of x, a function where we would input usually a real number. So for example, sine of pi over four or sine of zero. And we could ask what would happen if we plugged in a complex number? So in other words, can we extend the definition of sine to take complex values as an input. So f of z equals sine z. So we typically use the letter z when we're talking about a complex number. So for example, we could ask what is sine of i? And there's a way to define it that's a natural extension of the original sine function. And by the way, I'm gonna make a video on the sine function. And when I do that, I'll put a link to that video in the description of this video. But we could define not only sine of z, but also cosine of z or tangent of z, or e to the z, or even natural log of z. And in fact, that's the one we're interested in in this video because we're trying to see 
what should natural log of i be defined as? And actually, of these four functions here, natural log of z is probably the most interesting and the most complicated of these functions, which I'll explain why in just a minute. All right, so how should we define natural log of z? Well, every complex number z can be written in the form a plus bi. In fact, that's really just the definition of a complex number is a number that can be written in this form. But every complex number can also be written in what's called polar form. So any complex number z can be written in the form r times e to the i theta. And ultimately, this really comes from that Euler's formula. So e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. But this is called polar form, and it's kind of equivalent to the idea of polar coordinates when we're talking about ordered pairs in the plane. In fact, geometrically, what's happening here is this r is what's called the modulus of z. Some people say the absolute value of z. But when we're talking about complex numbers, we call this the modulus of z. And in terms of a and b, this would be the square root of a squared plus b squared. And this theta is sometimes called the argument of z. OK, now geometrically, what's happening here is that if we have a point here in the complex plane, which we'll call z, the distance from this point to the origin, this is this number r. And this angle here is the theta. And of course, this is the a and this is the b here. So notice r is the distance from this point z to the origin. And notice it's the square root of a squared plus b squared. And theta is this angle. Now, I should mention, and it's very important here for the logarithm to mention, that this angle theta is not unique. In fact, we could always add a multiple of 2 pi or subtract a multiple of 2 pi and get an angle that's equivalent to this angle. But when we pick the theta to be between negative pi and pi, that's called the principal value of the angle or the principal value of the argument of z. Now, where does the e to the i theta get involved? Well, that goes back to the Euler's formula. So e to the i theta is cosine theta plus i sine theta. So z here could be written as r times the quantity cosine theta plus i sine theta, which ends up equaling r cosine theta plus r sine theta times i. So we here we're at the point r cosine theta plus i times r sine theta, right? So the, this is like polar coordinates for that point. So I'm kind of assuming that you've seen this before, but I'll have another video where I explain the polar form of a complex number a little better. And when I do that, I'll put the link in the description of this video. Okay, so if we want to define natural log of z, we can write z as r times e to the i theta. And then if we want the properties of logarithms to hold for our logarithm function, we can rewrite this as natural log of r plus natural log of e to the i theta. All right, so we have a product here, so we can rewrite this using the product property of logarithms. Now, notice at this point we have natural log of e to the i theta, and so this should just be i theta. So we can rewrite this as natural log of r plus i theta. And we can rewrite this now back in terms of z, so natural log of r, remember r was the modulus of z, and theta is the argument of z. So the definition of natural log of z is this natural log of the modulus of z plus i times the argument of z. Now notice this is real, and the argument of z is a real number, but multiply by i, you get imaginary. So the real part is this, the imaginary part is this. And this is our definition of natural log of z. So then the question is, what is natural log of i? OK, that's what you're trying to figure out. What is natural log of i? Well, if we plug it in here, we get natural log of the modulus of i plus i times the argument of i. OK, now what is the modulus of i and what is the argument of i? Well, if we plot the point i, so let's say 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 3, the point i would be right here. Right? This is i. Notice it's really 0 plus 1i. Right? This, it's at the order of pairs 0, 1 here. This is i. Now notice what is the modulus of i. Well, this length is just 1. So the modulus of i is 1. And this angle, theta, would be pi over 2. So in other words, the argument of i 
is pi over 2. Now, I said the argument. That's really the principal argument of i because we're, if we pick a value that's between minus pi and pi, it's pi over 2. But again, we could always add or subtract a multiple of 2 pi. And that'll be important here in just a second. But notice, we can write this now as natural log of 1, right? The modulus of i is 1, plus i times the argument of i, but the argument of i is pi over 2. And of course, natural log of 1 is 0. And so what we end up getting is just pi over 2 times i, just like I said it was. Now, to finish off this video, I want to mention one more thing. The idea of this angle not being unique really means that natural log of i is not just this one number, pi over 2 times i, because the argument of i could be pi over 2 plus a multiple of 2 pi. So the argument of i we could put plus 2 pi times k, where k is an integer. So in other words, we can rewrite this whole thing as pi over 2 plus 2 pi k times i. That's what natural log of i is. Notice it's actually multiple different values, really infinitely many different values. When k is 0, we get the principal value of natural log of i. Now, this may seem a bit strange, but I want to convince you that it's not all that strange. In fact, we run across a similar situation with real numbers. So, for example, if I were to ask you, what is the square root of 9? Well, of course, you'd say, oh, it's 3. And why is it 3? Well, it's 3 because 3 squared is 9. But isn't it also true? that negative 3 quantity squared is 9. So why do we say that the square root of 9 is 3 and not negative 3? Well, just by convention, we pick the positive one. We could think of 3 as really being sort of like the principal value of the square root of 9. And negative 3, though, is another value. OK, that's the square root of 9, or 9 to the 1 half power. In fact, it turns out that every complex number, other than 0, has two different square roots. And a similar thing happens with cube roots. So for example, if I were to ask you, what's the cube root of 8? Well, the cube root of 8 is 2, okay? And the reasoning is because 2 cubed is 8. And you might think, okay, well, that's the only cube root of 8. In fact, negative 2 is not going to work, right? Because if we cube negative 2, we get negative 8. But actually, you can check if you did negative 1 plus the square root of 3 times i, and you cube that, you also get 8. And similarly, negative 3 minus the square root of 3 times i, if you cube that, you also get 8. So in fact, there's really three cube roots of 8. There's two, and then there's these other ones here. So the square root function is actually multivalued, and same thing with the cube root. So every number other than 0 has two different square roots, and every complex number other than 0 has three different cube roots. Well, it turns out that every complex number other than 0 has infinitely many different logarithms, different natural logarithms because of this ambiguity in the argument function. So this natural log function here is really a multi-valued function. That's what makes it a little more interesting or a little more complicated than sine of z and cosine of z and e to the z. That's because this argument here can take on multiple different values. So the natural log function, which by the way, usually it's written as just log of z rather than natural log of z, so when you're taking calculus for the first time or algebra, usually they write log for log base 10. And, and the cal button on your calculator that's written as log means log base 10. But in higher math, uh, log really means natural log. So typically you'll see it just written as log of z rather than natural log of z. But that function really deserves a whole video uh, of itself to really understand this whole natural log function. So the final thing to point out then is that when we did i to the i power and we got e to the natural log of i to the i and we simplified this, so we wrote this as e to the i times natural log of i. Well, natural log of i, I, I said it was pi over 2 times i. That's the principal value of natural log of i. But remember, natural log of i was equal to natural log of the modulus of i plus i times the argument of i. And this is just 0. And, but the argument of i is really pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. So what we get for natural log of i is pi over 2 plus 2 pi k times i. And so when we plug this in here for natural log of i, so instead of just plugging in pi over 2, we can plug in pi over 2 times i. We can plug in pi over 2 plus 2 pi k times i.
and we write this as e to the, well, the i squared becomes negative 1, and we get negative pi over 2 plus 2 pi k. So actually, i to the i power has many different values. When k is 0, we get just e to the negative pi over 2, which was that decimal, 0 0.207. But notice that for all values of k, no matter what uh, integer value of k we take, this is real. So i to the i has many different values, just like the square root of 9 has two different values, or the cube root of 8 has three different values. i to the power of i has infinitely many different values. The principal value is that e to the negative pi over 2. But really, for any value of k that you take, this is going to be real. In fact, in Desmos here, I've done the calculation e to the negative pi over 2 plus 2 pi k for different values of k. When k is 0, we get this value. If k is 1, notice we get a smaller decimal, a decimal that's closer to 0. And same thing, k equals 2. We're getting even tinier and tinier decimals as k gets bigger. Now, when k becomes negative, these numbers start blowing up. Right? And you can see that it's because of the form that it has right here. So i to the power of i is this thing. For all these different values of k, we're getting these numbers that are getting decimals that where some of them get closer and closer to zero, some of them blow up. But notice they're all real numbers. So i to the power of i is really a set of real numbers, the principal value of which is e to the negative pi over 2.